Well, it's a joy to be back with you again and uh, talking to you. Um, I hope that you're enjoying this series, and in actual fact, it's, it's really best if you follow the whole series because um, dealing as I am uh, with specific books in the Bible, um, if for any reason you are watching for the first time, please do trace back, and you can. At the end of the program, I'll we'll try and give you the way in which you can actually view the earlier messages, because it's important. Um, now, usually in uh, Hebrews, I've been dealing with the New International Version, but I do believe now, on this occasion, I need to go back into the Authorized Version. Um, normally, in preaching, I use the Authorized because there can be confusion with the different translations. And I don't know, but <laughs> people call me old-fashioned, but I still think that basically, to me, the most accurate is the King James or the authorized version of the Bible. Now, in order to try to explain this, um, what we're dealing with here very clearly in uh, chapter 7, and we're going to be continuing in chapter 8, is priesthood. Now, it's obviously clear that towards the end of chapter 7, if I can recap a little bit on what I was saying previously, that in this, Jesus is referred to as the high priest, He's identified with this chap called Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem. But many of us believe that Melchizedek, because he's without beginning and ending, was in actual fact a pre-incarnation appearance of Jesus. So... That, when you understand that, you'll understand a little bit more, because if we come back to the end, I'm looking at verse 20 of chapter 7, um, uh, it's, uh, it's the creating of the priest in verse 21. Those priests which were made without an oath, that's with an oath by him that said to him, the Lord swear and will not repent, you're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, it's quite clear that Paul, who's writing to the Jews here, the Hebrew people, is quite clearly identifying Melchizedek as being different to all the normal priests. And yet, Melchizedek represented the Old Testament dispensation. Now, let's get this right, and I think it's important that we begin here. Melchizedek, referred to here, represents the Old Testament. But in verse 22, uh, Jesus was made a surety of a better testament. So if you can see that although it appears that Melchizedek was probably a pre-incarnation appearance of Jesus, he still, in that, represented, and you've got to understand a link between the two. He was representing the old order. But then the Lord swear that um, Jesus would become a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so Jesus now replaces the old order. Have you got it? It is really, and that's where we begin to come into chapter 8. You see, um, if you look at the end of chapter 7, the high priest had to make sacrifices. And those sacrifices were for sin. 
And because of the Old Testament order, they had to be made daily or weekly or in order to atone for sin. But those sacrifices were not permanent. They had to be constantly repeated. Now, the new high priest has come, and as you will see, his sacrifice is final. We don't need any more. Now, this is the important thing to understand here, because here you've got the changeover between the old order of priesthood, um, where sacrifices had to be made consistently and regularly. Now you've got the new order, the new priesthood, where Jesus Christ, who becomes our high priest, himself becomes the sacrifice. Now, I am trying to explain this to you, uh, so I want you to understand. Now, let's look at the first verse of chapter 8. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this adds it all up. So, in other words, um, uh, Paul is summarizing, and he says, we have a high priest now who is sat on the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. Do you understand? So whereas the previous priests were earthly, and as you know, in the old temple, the old tabernacle, and remember the temple has been rebuilt, uh, Jesus was in the temple, and things happened there. But the fact is that uh, whereas in the old temple, only the high priest could enter into the holy place once a year. And in fact, it's quite fascinating to realize that he wore a specific robe with bells on the bottom. And the reason was that... Um, it was anticipated nobody could enter into the presence of God and live. But all the time, the people outside could hear the tinkling of the bells. They knew the high priest was alive and representing them before God in that sanctuary. So now you'll find that the high priest is not in an earthly temple but is now actually literally living permanently in the presence of God. He sat on the right hand of God in heaven. And here in verse 2, as a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, not created by man, but created by God, because in verse 3, every high priest ordained by earthly position is ordained to offer gifts and make sacrifices. And it's necessary that that earthly priest has to have something to offer. But now, in the new order, the new dispensation, the high priest, the new high priest is actually in God's presence permanently. He sat at the right hand of the Father. 